Howdy, Central. I just wanted to say, if you're looking for another opportunity to worship this week, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock is a community-wide Thanksgiving service. Several churches will be coming together. Down at People's Church at 6 o'clock, I'm bringing the message and would love for you to come and join us 6 o'clock tomorrow night. We're going to be in Genesis today. We are going through the book of Genesis, and so we hit chapter 6 today, and I've already been approached this morning about answering some questions in Genesis chapter 6, because the truth is, sometimes the Bible gives us problems. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it challenges our beliefs. Sometimes it challenges our behavior. Sometimes it's really, really easy to understand, but it's just really hard to accept. And at other times, it's just plain hard to understand. Well, we have three problems that we're going to address in this text today, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him to His heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So obviously, this is the setup to the flood story. This is the setup for Noah and the ark, and we are going to get to that after Christmas. Because starting next week, I'll be preaching an Advent series titled First Encounter. So we'll take a little break from Genesis and pick up later. But let's get to the first problem. The first problem in the passage has to do with the sons of God and the daughters of men. Who in the world are the sons of God that are marrying the daughters of men. Do you know that throughout history, a lot of ink has been spilled on this very subject matter, on this very topic? And so there have been a variety of interpretations put forth, and I'm going to give you four of those, the four primary ones that we see. And of course, the way we always do it is the last one is the one that I hold to. But we'll look at these four and consider the validity of them. And I'll have you bear in mind that the single most important factor in reading interpreting and understanding Scripture is context that was weak, but I'm hoping you're still getting there. So, who are these sons of God? Are they angels? Some have suggested, in fact, this has been pretty prevalent by a lot of people. Some have suggested that these were angels that were coming to earth and actually marrying women on the earth. What's the problem with that? There's no indication that that's taking place. When we look in this text, there's no indication that something like that is going on. But remember, when we talk about context, we begin with immediate context, right? What's going on in this passage? What's happening in this context? But there's also a biblical context. And what else does the Bible say about this idea of angels marrying human beings? The closest we get is something that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22 when Jesus says angels don't marry. So in my opinion, when Jesus says angels don't marry, the idea that angels are getting married would contradict Jesus, so that's not, a, that's not a good interpretation of this passage. Some have suggested that the sons of God were demon-possessed men that were marrying human women. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I see no validity throughout Scripture for calling demon-possessed men sons of God. Thirdly, some have suggested that these sons of God are rulers or kings who were taking multiple women 
by force for their harems. This actually does hold a little bit of water because in Scripture, there are times when we see the kings or the rulers or the judges referred to as gods with a little g, meaning that they're, they're gods, they're lords over their little kingdoms in the scope of God's kingdom. However, there's no indication. Remember, this is the beginning of civilization. There's no indication there was ever any kind of ruling class, certainly no king at that time. So contextually, I believe we can rule that one out as well. I tend to go with the interpretation of most of the church fathers, including Augustine, who was the greatest theologian of the first many centuries of the church, and the theology and interpretation that came out of the Protestant Reformation that these were godly men. You might remember that we ended chapter 4 Chapter 4 was talking about all this corruption that was going on and all these different things that were happening, but chapter 4 ends with talking about Adam and Eve's son Seth having a son named Enosh, and in his day, people began to call on the name of the Lord. So these would be descendants of Seth, the, the people who worship God. So you had men who were worshiping God, marrying non-godly women. We have to admit this passage is still obscure, but this seems very consistent with the rest of Scripture. Let's think contextually about when this is being written down. Who wrote Genesis? Moses wrote Genesis. And Moses is writing Genesis at a time when the people of Israel are prepared to go into the promised land. And what were they supposed to do when they got to the promised land? They were supposed to wipe out all of the pagan people in the promised land. And I find it interesting that God gives a command to wipe out all the people, and he knows they're not going to do it, because what does he command them not to do? Marry the pagan women. He knows they're not going to do it, and we'll see more of that in just a minute. But they're going into the promised land, and Moses is preparing for them for that, and this contextually fits with that idea so that they can see the dangers of that. The danger of marrying these women who did not worship God and then starting to worship their gods. And God said that's exactly what they were going to do. Now, in Scripture... Again, contextually this fits because the people of God, and this goes into the New Testament, this goes with the Israelites, were not supposed to marry those who did not worship their God. And in the New Testament, Christians are never supposed to marry non-Christians. This isn't even one of those gray areas in Scripture. And so, let me just take a minute, since this, I believe, is what this passage is about, by talking about the numerous problems with intermarriage. When we talk about intermarriage, we're not talking about interracial marriage. That is never forbidden in Scripture. We're talking about interfaith marriages. Number one, marriage is to bear the image of God. You remember, we learned that God created man. And isn't it interesting? God created man in his own image, male and female in his own image. We serve this triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, who have existed for all eternity absolutely the same in essence and nature. But they're different. They're different persons. One God, three persons, eternally coexistent, different form and function. And we, as male and female, are supposed to bear forth the image of God by showing how we come together to show this same nature but different form and function. Well, if a husband and wife are to bear forth the image of God, the husband and wife have to both be committed to that. We have to realize that our primary purpose, by the way, when I, when I do premarital counseling, this is one of the questions I ask, what is the purpose of marriage? What are the purposes of marriage? And I have yet to ask that question and gotten this answer, that the purpose of our marriage when we get together is to show forth the image of God and our complementarianism, and and the way that we complement each other. We are supposed to bear forth the image of God, and we must both be committed to that. A second reason is the idea of one flesh. Moses, I mean, Moses, when, when Adam and Eve got married, God, when he gave Eve to Adam, he said that a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one 
flesh. When this is talked about over in the New Testament, we're told this is a profound mystery, but we become one flesh. I was asked to share in a uh, Sunday school class last week about my calling to the ministry, and, and one of the things I talked about is when Terry and I were not on the same page about this early on, and I really thought the Lord was calling me to be a pastor. Well, she did too, but she wasn't really on board yet. And I went and talked to uh, one of the, the pastors at our church, and I sat down, and I, I visited with him. I said, I don't know what to do. I think I'm called to, to ministry, and Terry's, d- Terry doesn't want to talk about it. And he said, well, here's one, one of two things is going on. One, either you're wrong, and God's not calling you to the ministry, or he's calling you, and it's not time yet. Because when you married Terry, you became one flesh. You are one new creation now, and God will not call part of you. He will call both of you, so you just need to keep doing what you've been doing and wait and see what's happening. The thing is, when we are one flesh, we come together with the same passions, the same goals, and we have to be one in our worship. Another purpose of marriage is making disciples of the next generation. It's really hard for a Christian and a non-Christian to raise godly children. It's really hard when they don't have the same goals, same passions, same desires for their children. You ask Christian parents, what what do you want for your, your children? We want our children to know and love and serve Jesus all their lives. Yeah, but what about their career? What about their education? We want them to know and love and serve Jesus. Whatever they're calling, wherever they go, whatever happens in their lives, that's our priority. And if both parents aren't on the same page with that, the children aren't going to be brought up with that direction in mind. Fourth is the role of the husband to be the spiritual leader. Again, this really isn't a gray area in Scripture, that the husband is supposed to be the spiritual leader in the home. Now, if the husband is not a Christian, how can he possibly give spiritual direction and leadership in his home? He can't. But what if the husband is a Christian and the wife is not a Christian? How is he going to disciple her and give that spiritual leadership in his home? And then finally... We have to talk about the faith of the believer because it is common in an interfaith marriage for the faith of the believer to be corrupted. Why did God say don't do this? Why did God say when they went into the promised land that you're not supposed to marry the pagan women? Because you're going to start worshiping their gods. And that's what happened every single time. By the way, dating and marriage are not good evangelism strategies. Oh, yeah, I'm going to date a non-Christian so that I can win the non-Christian to Jesus. No, no. You know what? That happens sometimes. Rarely. What happens? You have, you have a, a, a godly Christian person who marries a non-Christian. Here's what happens every time the non-Christian says, oh, I'm going to support everything they want to do. Never happens. I won't say never. Rarely happens. Because the Christian says, well, I want to give 10% of our income to the church. The Christian says, I want to spend our vacation time going on mission trips. The Christian says, I can't can't go camping every weekend. I'm going to be in church on Sunday morning. The Christian says, I have these priorities in my life, and the non-Christian doesn't. And I'm telling you, it always goes the wrong direction. This, this intermarriage, the sons of God, the godly men marrying non-godly women was cited as a reason for the moral corruption of society in the earliest days of the world. It's intermarriage throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, all the way until the Babylonian captivity in 586 B.C., this was the greatest weakness among God's people from the kings all the way down. And here we're seeing the beginning of it and the earliest warning signs of what happened. So that's the first problem. Second problem in the passage, who are these Nephilim dudes? The Nephilim. Well, those who believe that angels were marrying humans or this was demon-possessed people marrying non-demon-possessed women believe the Nephilim are the descendants of them. However, the passage never says the Nephilim are descendants of these interfaith marriages. In fact, it indicates that the Nephilim were around before that. In fact, if you look, it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in the daughters of man. So they were there before they started having offspring. The only other mention of the Nephilim is Numbers chapter 13. So we have very, very little information. All we know is what we're told here is that they were mighty 
men of renown. They were mighty men of renown. Now, one indication we do get is in Hebrew, the root of their name is the word for fall. And so Nephilim literally means fallen ones. So this was likely, again, we don't know this for certain, but this was likely a violent class of people since they seem in this passage to be linked to the downfall of mankind. Well, there is another problem in the passage. It's not really in the passage. It's a problem that we run into with the passage. Pilots can talk to you about a problem that they train to avoid called fixation. Let's say flying along in an airplane and something goes wrong. There's a warning light that comes on, engine catches fire, electrical system failure, engine failure, some other system failure. It is really easy to get fixated on the problem and completely forget about flying the airplane. And here's what we do a lot of times when we're reading the Bible is we get fixated on the problems and forget what we're trying to do here. And here's what happens with Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, is there's so much discussion on who the sons of God and daughters of men are. There's so much discussion on the Nephilim that frequently we forget the main point of what's actually going on in this passage. So let's not get fixated on the things that we don't have clarity about. Instead, let's fix our eyes on what we do have clarity about. Three things here. Number one, people were wicked. Nobody argues that point. Verse 5 says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And this statement, y'all, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, we don't need to speculate on what they were doing. Well, what exactly were they doing that was so wicked? Because there's nothing new under the sun. Think of all the wicked things going on in the world today, wicked things they were doing thousands of years ago. People were wicked. What's most important is not what they were doing, but that they were wicked, and even their thoughts were wicked, and we see that God knew that. This is something fascinating. God knows the wicked thoughts that we have. Back in Joshua, a lot of people have, have this scripture verse somewhere in their house. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's really interesting in context. Because what's going on here is Joshua had led the people into the promised land. And he's about to die. So he gets the people together to renew their covenant. But he says to them, you need to make a choice. You need to decide whether you're going to worship the gods across the river, the gods of Egypt, all the pagan gods that your parents worshipped, or whether you're going to worship the pagan gods of this land, the gods of the Amorites. So pick one. He's telling them, pick your pagan god. I'm going to worship the Lord. My house is going to worship the Lord. And you know what they say to him? They say, oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to worship those pagan gods. We're going to worship the one true God with you. And he knew they weren't going to. By the way, how did he know that? He says, okay, then you've got to go get rid of all the pagan gods you're worshiping right now. He knew they weren't going to do that. And why? Back when Joshua was commissioned in Deuteronomy 31, back Moses was about to die, Joshua was going to take over. Joshua was going to be the guy to lead them in the promised land. Listen to what God said at that time. He said, you're going to take these people into the promised land and they're all going to rebel and worship the pagan gods. Well, how does he know that? Listen to what he said. For I know that they are inclined to do even today before I have brought them into the land I swore to give. I knew, I know God says what they're inclined to do. Even before they get there, this means God knows the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. This means we can sing, we can learn the Christian lingo, we can put on a good show, we can call ourselves Christians, but God always knows what's going on in our hearts and in our heads. We cannot fool God. The people were wicked then, even in their secret places. 
And so the second thing we see is that God was grieved. I don't know about y'all, but this is an awful verse to read. The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. Dang, huh? Wow. God was grieved. Does God actually get grieved? Yes, by what we do, God intentions and purposes to be grieved. Why is he so grieved? Over the years, I've had so many friends, people I've known who've had, who've had uh, adultery in their marriages. They've been cheated on. And it really upsets me when that happens to my friends. And sometimes it even makes me angry. But what happens, and some of you have probably experienced this, you are grieving when that happens to you. And why? Because it's a betrayal. It's a betrayal of trust. And what we don't realize is that when we sin, when we have evil thoughts, when we speak wicked words, it is a betrayal of God. When we do what we want to, when we do whatever we think feels good, it is a betrayal of God. They were esteeming the violent men, but God's perspective was different, and he took it personally. And what we esteem and how we behave matters to God, and we need to realize that. And what we see in this passage is that God had enough. He had enough. Verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, but he is free as flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Verse 7, The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I have made them. Now, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One, when the Lord speaks here, do you realize this is the first time in Scripture we have a record of Lord speaking until he spoke to Cain after Cain killed Abel? We have generations and generations and generations and generations and not a word recorded from God. And the next time God chooses to speak, what does he say? My spirit shall not abide in man forever. Wow. You say, Lord, I just want a word from you. Be careful. This was the word that they got. But what's going on with this 120 Years. Well, some have suggested, and I think there's validity to this, that what we have, and you saw that last week people were living five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred years, right? And after the flood, people start living like 300, 200, and then nobody really lives longer than 120 years after that. But how long did it take Noah to build the ark? 120 years. So when God speaks, he says, you've got 120 years. I'm not going to put up with you. You've got 100 years. 20 years. You know how it was when you were a kid? Y'all remember this? Some of you kids know exactly what I'm talking about. You're a kid and there's something you're not supposed to be doing and you really want to do it, right? So you decide, man, you get all worked up. I can remember, I used to start sweating. I'd get all shaky. I'd get worked up and I'd go do it. And I'm looking over my shoulder the whole time and I'm afraid I'm going to get caught. But then when I don't get caught, I start getting more comfortable with it. And after a while, I'm not looking over my shoulder at all. And then I turn around, and who's standing there? Mom. And it was mom we feared in our household. My little five-foot, three-inch mama brought the wrath. And it was never pleasant when you're off just headlong into whatever you know you're not supposed to be doing. One thing that was always forbidden, motorcycles. That was just like, you don't do it. A friend of mine said, hey, get on my motorcycle. I'm going to take you for a ride. I'm like, oh, no, I don't know, man. I can't do that. What if I get caught? He goes, oh, come on. I get on his motorcycle. Man, I'm just looking around. I'm so nervous. <laughs> Kid you not, pulled up at a stop sign next to my mom. <laughs> the good news, I had a helmet on. And she did not see me, but I'm like, get me off of this thing. (laughs) I don't ever want to ride a motorcycle again. Well, here's what we do, isn't it? We sin, and we feel bad when we sin. 
But hey, we didn't get caught. So maybe we can sin again. And hey, we didn't get caught that time. So we just keep going. And we just keep going. And we think we're home free. But listen to this. God will not put up with it forever. I hear people say, I've heard this so many times. I'm going to become a Christian. I'm just not ready yet. I'll become a Christian someday. I'll give my life to Christ someday. When is someday? Jesus was asked when he would return again. And he spoke about that. He was asked, when will you come back and what's it going to be like? Listen to what he said in Matthew 24, verses 37 through 41. For as were in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the meal, one will be taken and one left. God had spoken, and he's spoken today, right? But everybody's just going along eating and drinking and marrying and doing everything. You say, but when's it going to happen, Mike? Well, we, we look at that passage, Matthew 24, verses 37 through 41. Let's look at the bookends to that in verse 20. Four, chapter 24, verse 36, he says, Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. And then verse 42, he says, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. And here's our takeaway today. Our takeaway has three parts to it, but the last one, the last one's the real takeaway today, all right? And these are the things, you've heard this before, Central for me. These are the three things we know. A lot of schools have thought about it. What's it going to look like when Jesus comes? Here are the things we can all agree with. Number one, Jesus is coming back. He is coming back. We just sang about this day, this, this day, the day that he returns, the day when every knee will bow, when every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is coming back. Part two, we don't know when. When somebody comes along, as people have been doing for 2,000 years, identifying key figures and all this and naming dates and saying we only have this much time, for 2,000 years, they've all been wrong, and they'll keep being wrong. Nobody knows when. What does Jesus say here? He says that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels, not even the sun. So don't buy into that. But here's the deal, and here's the third thing, and here's the big takeaway. Be ready. Be ready. In Noah's day, as we're going to see, they knew it was coming. My goodness, all of Noah's friends see him big, building this big boat. It was a big boat. We'll talk about the size of the boat. We'll talk about whether the boat was big enough to contain all the animals. It was, by the way. That's just a preview. <laughs> and they're seeing They know. They know. But they had time until the rain started falling. You need to be ready, and you can be ready, because God, you see, is still grieved over sin, but he's so grieved and so moved to compassion that he sent his son. He is so grieved over sin that instead of just wiping us all out, he sent his son to suffer in our place. He sent his son to take the wrath that we deserve. He sent his son to bear our guilt, to bear our shame, to bear all of our uncleanliness. And Jesus bore all the awful wrath that we have deserved. Now, I know we say, oh, Mike, I'm not that bad. I'm really a good person. I want to remind you that God knows your heart. He knows every thought and every intention of your heart. And when you say, I'm a really good person, I just want to ask you, how many in this room would love, just love for us to see how good you are? By having on the screens a presentation of every action, every word, every thought you've had the last seven days. Obviously, we can't do that. And we're all really glad, aren't we? 
All us really good people don't want anybody knowing what really goes on in here. And Jesus suffered for all of it, and you can escape the coming judgment. Listen, here's the deal. Here's the tie-in, okay? You can escape the coming judgment the same way Noah did. And Hebrews 11 tells us how Noah escaped the judgment. Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. How was Noah saved? Two words, bookends of verse 7, by faith. By faith. Noah had to trust God. And if you want to escape the coming wrath, you have to trust God. Now, by the way, trust isn't some feeling. Trust isn't some warm, fuzzy thing. Oh, man, you just got to have faith. Faith in what? You have to have faith in Christ alone. You have to trust him truly. And Noah demonstrated that he had faith. How did he demonstrate that? By building an ark and by going inside. By faith, we're saved from the coming day when we believe God and we demonstrate it by turning to Jesus with our whole hearts. He is coming back, and only those who seek refuge in Jesus will be safe. Are you ready? You can be if you want to be. Let's pray. Holy Father, we are so thankful for this reminder that you know all the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And we're thankful for this reminder that you have warned us and invited us and urged us to come to you and be saved. And we pray that today there wouldn't be anybody in this room who would say, yeah, I'll become a Christian someday. But that that someday would be today. And that everyone in this room would be able to leave this place knowing that if Jesus returns this afternoon, they're safe. So, Father, let your will be done in every heart. Let everyone in this room trust you completely. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.